Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the um, Office of Child Care through the State Capacity Building Center Perspectives from Research and Practice, Limiting COVID-19 Transmission in Child Care Programs. We are at the very top of the hour, and people are still joining. So we're going to take just a deep breath in order to get, um, to get started. Um, we do see a raised hand. Um, how can we help you? Colin Plumage, we see that your hand is raised. Are you having any technical issues? If you have a question, please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, I believe that if uh, the hand was raised in um, while exploring the Adobe room, you can press that hand raised again. There we go, and it uh, it does go away. So we certainly welcome you for um, for this afternoon. We are so happy to see that people are indeed signing in, letting us know that they are watching um, with other colleagues, and we appreciate that very much. It's good to know that, that you could join us this afternoon. I'd like to take just a moment to share some technical information. All the lines are muted, and if you are using your phone to join the audio, you can press star 6 to mute and or unmute. We would appreciate you keeping your line muted um, if, you, uh, if you are not speaking. And there are times throughout the presentation when we will be um, asking you certainly to put any questions in the chat, and then there may be an opportunity for you to clarify a question as we go on. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome this afternoon Dr. Ellen Wheatley. Uh, Dr. Wheatley Hello. is the Deputy Director at the Office of Child Care. Hi, Ellen. Um, I think you have some opening remarks. I do, and thank you for the opportunity to give them. Um, this is a wonderful webinar. Uh, in August, CDC published a paper that looked at secondary COVID-19 transmission in Rhode Island child care settings as the state reopened the child care programs in June under enhanced health and safety requirements and protocols. The report found that transmission in child care settings was very limited, which was likely the result of Rhode Island Department of Health's response for transmission and child care programs adherence to those requirements. We're very excited to have this webinar today to bring together the individuals who worked on the paper, as well as the individuals who have been instrumental in Rhode Island's success. You will have the opportunity to hear from them about the paper, the story behind the findings, which is a strong collaborative effort between Rhode Island Human Services Department, the Rhode Island Health Department, and the child care providers to keep children, families, and child care staff healthy. The presenters will offer their perspectives on how Rhode Island was able to limit COVID-19 transmission in child care settings and what is needed to continue to minimize transmission moving forward. They'll share more about the state's implementation of health and safety requirements, child care provider supports, and ongoing efforts to limit COVID-19 transmission in child care settings. We will also have the opportunity to hear from a child care provider about their experiences offering care throughout this time. I want to extend my thanks to Gail Kelso, the teams from Rhode Island, uh, the provider who is coming to tell a great story, and everyone else who contributed to developing and presenting this webinar. Now, Gail Kelso will introduce a wonderful group of presenters for today. So I hand it back. Thank you, Ellen. 
Uh, we appreciate so much your being with us this afternoon. I am Gail Kelso, and I'm serving as host today. Sue Foley from the State Systems Specialist Network, uh, who works in Region 1 of the Child Care State Capacity Building Center, will be serving as facilitator. I also have the great honor and privilege of introducing the presenters. And um, in alphabetical order by first name, we have Amanda Delagrado. Uh, she is the epidemiologist with the Rhode Island Department of Health. Andrea Engel is from the Pawtucket YMCA and is the child care director there. Caitlin Molina is the Deputy Director of the Rhode Island Department of Human Services. And finally, Ruth Link Gellis is the Doctoral Epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that we all know as the CDC. I welcome everyone again. And um, Ruth, would you get us started? Hi, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the time to be here today and to talk to everyone. Um, I actually have a two-year-old daughter myself, and so this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, I love that we get the opportunity to highlight the great work that Rhode Island did um, in child care transmission for COVID-19. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, just to kind of set the stage, a little bit. Um, we really didn't know much about child care and COVID-19 in the spring and summer of 2020. Um, you know, I think we feel like there are so many things now that we don't know, but uh, if we think back to the late spring, it was really even more of a black box. So we knew from research both here in the U.S. and abroad that children seemed much less likely to get severe illness compared to adults. Um, but that was really it. Uh, so much of child care had closed down so quickly after the first cases in the U.S. were identified, and so we really didn't have a lot of information about how young children might transmit to each other or transmit to adults. Um, and then importantly, um, we didn't know what strategies could, could work in child care. We didn't know what we could do to reduce risk uh, to children and teachers in child care. Um, and and, and again, as, as, a, as a parent of a young child trying to work through the pandemic, I think these questions were really at the top of my mind um, when, I, when, when I tried to work with my own daycare um, to, to get their program back up and running. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So um, Rhode Island was in this really unique position to be able to look at some of these questions and try to fill in gaps in our understanding. Um, they, uh, pretty early on in the pandemic, closed down all of their child care facilities and then set um, a, a defined reopening date for child care. So they really had um, good information on when child care facilities were reopening, which facilities were reopening, how big those facilities were, and so on. Um, and then they required reopening plans, which meant that uh, the Department of Health um, and the Department of Human Services had really good uh, visibility as to how facilities were thinking about reopening, uh, what they were asking facilities to do and think through um, all the mitigation measures as they said about reopening. And then, um, and I think this is a really important piece, they were able to provide some funds to help offset costs for things like reduced enrollment, um, which meant that facilities could keep their class sizes small uh, and, and thus reduce transmission in child care. Um, and, but, you know, didn't have to worry about the cut into their tuition money. Um, Rhode Island Department of Health provided this fantastic uh, clear guidelines through their um, response playbook for child care. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to see it, I would highly encourage you to go to the Rhode Island Department of Health website and look at it. It's just got great guidelines lined up. Uh, very clear flow charts that um, would be accessible to child care providers that they could sort of work through if they had a potential exposure or a case in their facility so they could know what to do and when to engage with the Department of Health. Um, and then really importantly, the Department of Health was able to do pretty consistent follow-up and investigate probable and confirmed cases associated with child care. Um, so they were able to work very closely with child care facilities 
um, and make sure that facilities were doing everything that they could once they had a probable or confirmed case identified to stop an outbreak um, in the facility before it started. Slide. So um, my colleagues in Rhode Island will go into a lot more detail, um, but just as a very high level summary, um, I think they were able to pull out a, a few key points that really meant that there was less transmission in childcare. Um, one was that the state had worked really hard to reduce uh, community spread of disease, um, which meant that there were just not a lot of cases introduced into childcare in the beginning. Although, as you'll see in the presentation later on, um, we did see spikes in cases in childcare as uh, spikes in cases occurred in the community. Um, they were able to reduce introduction of COVID-19 into childcare through some daily symptom screening and monitoring of children and staff. Um, and then this is, I think, the really key part here. They did a lot of work to, at stopping transmission within childcare. Um, so this goes back to the requirements that they included in their playbook and then the plans that they reviewed for facilities, hand washing, disinfection of high touch surface, surfaces, um, all the engagement with facilities to ensure a, a really rapid follow-up and quarantine with exposed individuals. Stable group structures, um, I think this was a really key point that they essentially had facilities operate classrooms as pods so that if a case was identified in a classroom, it meant that only that classroom needed to be quarantined, that that classroom had not interacted with the rest of the school. Um, and so the, the entire school didn't have to be shut down, um, which meant that even when they did identify outbreaks, they tended to be on the smaller side. Um, and then really key, of course, masks were required for staff. Um, we know from all the research in the general population now just how important masks are and what a huge impact they can have. Um, so Rhode Island, by requiring masks for staff right from the beginning, uh, right from, from the time that facilities were able to reopen, um, I think was able to stop a lot of transmission. Um, and then, as you'll see from the presentations by Caitlin and Amanda in Rhode Island, the the Rhode Island um, public health arm and the regulatory agency were really able to work very closely together. Um, it meant that there was just this great um, dialogue between the two agencies uh, and clear collaboration as they put uh, the requirements in place for reopening and then also um, as they were able to investigate uh, cases uh, or outbreaks within child care. Um, so I think that is all I have. Um, and at this point, I am really uh, pleased to turn it over to Caitlin and Amanda in Rhode Island. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Ruth. This is Caitlin Molina. Um, I'm from Rhode Island Department of Human Services. And um, I just want to first thank Ruth and her team at the CDC for the expertise and the you know, collaboration that they lended upon the reopening of child care. Um, just their expertise and their support during such a trying time for both our providers and our families was just really, um, it was remarkable. And so I just want to commend her and her team and, you know, the Department of Health as well for their work in supporting our, you know, our providers and reopening and serving families in Rhode Island. If we could move to the next slide. Um, so for part of reopening, we really in Rhode Island approach this in a few different phases. And the first and foremost was we wanted to set up a framework in which we would clearly articulate to programs and providers what the expectations to safely reopen were. Um, and so there was a two-fold approach to that. We wanted to make sure that we were providing clear guidance to families and providing them with immediate relief around payment practices and subsidy support. Um, and then we also wanted to support our child care programs who we wanted to be able to ensure that as many of them as we could were able to reopen once the mandated closure period was lifted. Um, you know, we will also take you through in this presentation sort of the numbers regarding reopening closures and our ongoing process to reopen and support new sites um, across the state of Rhode Island. And then I'll also talk you through a little bit of our regulatory enforcement approach and then a little bit about some data that we're seeing with our COVID-19 survey series that we've been sort of kind of previewing as we prepare for a market rate survey next year. If we can move to the next slide. Um, 
you know, I've always approached this first and foremost as a mother. Um, I work for mothers. My governor is a mother. My director at the Department of Human Services is a mother. Many of the women who work for me are mothers. Um, so all of the decisions, both in policy and practice, that we made, I really took a lens of how do we best protect and support our children. And then, of course, we have to think about business owners and making sure that they have a viable sort of pathway to reopen and continue supporting um, our most vulnerable families. So for families during COVID-19, Rhode Island kind of instituted immediately a few flexibilities in maintaining our payment practices and really supporting families. We waived all family co-pays during the mandated closure period for our subsidized families. Um, this is similar to you know, national trends that we've seen across other states. We waived all of the allowable absence policy for our subsidized slots, and we're continuing to do that moving forward. Um, we also, when there was, um, you know, federal stimulus dollars on the table and families saw that one-time stimulus payment or the unemployment boost, um, we were able to navigate that and find alternative funding through CRF to reinstate those families so they were able to preserve their subsidies um, even during the mandated closure period as they experienced a significant hike in their pay um, short term. And then we also began the work in Rhode Island, and this is not dissimilar from other states, I'm sure, who are on the line. Um, we have really been working over the course of the past couple of years to better get our arms around how to regulate and monitor summer camps. Um, and so this was our first crack at it during a pandemic. Um, we promulgated regulations and began the process of actually requiring summer camp providers to submit plans to the Department of Human Services um, and complete ongoing training and professional development to make sure that they were adhering to the regulations. Um, that we had set forth. And so we were able to approve 150 summer camp providers over the course of the past summer um, and provide high quality early learning opportunities for more than 19,000 youth during the pandemic. If we move to the next slide, um, it will talk a little bit about what we did to support programs, um, both during the mandated closure period and then to ensure a successful reopening. Um, so from mid-March until June 1st, all child care programs across the state of Rhode Island were required to close. Um, Mid-May, we notified programs that they were going to be allowed to reopen beginning June 1st, but there would be new set of regulations and um, guidelines that would they would need to demonstrate compliance to before reopening. Um, and part of that was submitting a COVID-19 plan. So across all of our licensed programs in the state of Rhode Island, every single licensed provider had to submit a COVID-19 control plan to the Department of Human Services. Um, and that plan required stable staffing patterns, clear understanding of our screening protocols to prevent and exclude children or staff who have COVID-19 symptoms from entering the building. Um, it also really required programs to think thoughtfully around cleaning guidelines and sanitation requirements. Um, as part of these new regulations and plan submission process, um, we also required, or we also kind of temporarily reduced license capacity for our programs. We've been gradually rebuilding that capacity um, as we've been reopened, but um, particularly upon the initial phase of reopening, programs had, a, at a max, were able to serve 10 children in a pod size at a time while still adhering to um, staff-child ratios and group sizes. We have now been able to gradually increase those group sizes to about 20. Um, to compensate for those lower capacity numbers, programs were issued a temporary rate enhancement, which is still in effect and we hope will remain in effect for our full state fiscal year. Um, so we obligated our CARES funding under the Child Care Development Block Grant to enable these temporary rate enhancements for subsidized slots. Um, in Rhode Island, we have a tiered reimbursement system. So programs, depending on their quality level, are reimbursed at a certain rate per child for their subsidized care. Um, we have temporarily moved all of those reimbursement rates to the top tier or the five-star level to compensate programs for having to hear, adhere to these more complex regulations and cleaning guidelines. We also distributed a full month supply of free PPE, which included um, the thermometers for programs so that they could reopen. Um, we also have a $5 million relief fund to compensate programs. The fund operates with two sort of paths. Um, one on-ramp for that fund is for small capital improvement projects to adhere to the new COVID regulations. So this could be programs that are building out capacity to have additional exits or entrances. 
um, create tent space, maybe actually install plexiglass to protect administrative staff. Um, the second on-ramp for this fund is really dedicated to covering lost revenue associated with the mandated closure period and reimbursing programs for fixed occupancy costs that they incur during that mandated closure period. If we move to the next slide. Um, so these are the numbers. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had about 911 licensed child care programs across the state of Rhode Island. Um, as you will recall, on June 1st, we required programs to begin submitting COVID-19 plans to reopen. Um, on June 30th, 631 of our programs reopened um, with approval from the Department of Human Services to do so. And so this represents 70% of our DHS license capacity, which was reopened and available to serve families by June 30th. You will note on this slide that by September 9th, we were at 87% capacity. So programs, as they oriented to the new regulations, either added additional capacity um, back to their pre-COVID license or license capacity, and additionally, we saw additional programs open. Um, and so as we move to the next slide, um, you will note that we anticipate and we are at 97% of our license programs have reopened in Rhode Island, which is fantastic. Um, the majority of them are operating with a slightly lower capacity than what they operated with before the pandemic, but they are open. Um, predominantly the programs that have either not opened or have reported to the department that they don't intend to reopen, um, it's a mix. Um, a lot of times it's either family child care providers. Um, this is an aging workforce. So under the preschool development grant, we had actually conducted a statewide workforce needs assessment and had identified that the average age of a family child care provider in Rhode Island is 55. Um, so for many of our family child care providers, they are either nearing retirement or have identified an underlying health condition, which just increased their risks and prevents their ability to safely reopen. Um, the other one is um, we have a lot of center-based programs, and I'm sure other states have seen this, as I've heard from my colleagues, particularly in Region 1. Um, that typically these child care programs would have operated in um, public school buildings. Public school buildings have not really reopened to outside vendors or programs to be able to serve children in before and after care. So a lot of our reduced capacity that we're experiencing this fall is due to our before and after care system being decimated, um, just absolutely decimated. And so um, we are hoping that as programs and schools reorient to new regulations, we will see more inclusion of that over time. Um, as you'll note, there have been some closures. Um, I noted sort of the cause and the reason, but what's also important is that we have been bringing a lot of new sites online. So I have a really tremendous um, child care licensing administrator. Her name is Nicole Cello. Um, and one thing that she continually reminds me is that although we've processed closures, which are unfortunate, we are also continually processing new applications for new child care programs to open. Um, and so you will see on that bottom chart that um, we are continually to pro continuing to process these new um, background checks. Not background checks, I'm sorry, applications for new sites. Um, so this is really interesting to me because I recently reviewed some information that shared that about 32 states across the nation um, submitted waivers to relax or to temporarily suspend unannounced monitoring for child care programs. Um, we really felt that unannounced monitoring was a necessary component and complement to our contact tracing and case investigation work with the Department of Health. Um, you'll hear Amanda Della Grata, my colleague from the Department of Health, we huddle every single day on COVID cases that occur in child care. And one of the reasons that I feel our response and our protocols are so strong in mitigating spread is that we are able to partner on the regulatory enforcement and monitoring that we are seeing in programs and talking through the case investigation and contract tracing the Department of Health is doing. And oftentimes, those two arms, both regulatory and public health, are able to meet in the middle to make really concrete decisions that both protect the health and safety of children, but also preserve operations for small businesses. And so pre-COVID, um, the Department of Human Services was new to licensing. I think um, we had just transitioned the licensing unit from our Child Welfare Agency in Rhode Island to DHS in October. 
Um, so we had only conducted about 160 unannounced monitoring visits pre-pandemic. Um, and you will note that because this was a new body of work to us, we were executing a high number of corrective action findings because we were really reorienting programs to regulations, providing them with technical assistance to reorient to those regulations, and really better understanding the miscon misconception and communication around some of the regulatory enforcement. Upon the reopening, the DHS licensing team um, this slide reflects through August, um, which said that from June through August, which was the summer months, we conducted 219 unannounced monitoring visits, which is fantastic. Um, I have to say that through October, the team has actually conducted 362 unannounced monitoring visits. Um, and as you'll note, the majority of the findings that they see when they are conducting these visits are non-compliances related to non-COVID regulations. So these are regulations that existed prior to COVID. When we look at just the COVID-specific violations, programs are broadly complying very nicely to these regulations and have really taken serious attention um, to the COVID-19 control plan. Um, and I should also add that, you know, the COVID-19 control plan required that programs actually have their staff complete professional development on the health and safety requirements before reopening. Um, our workforce study identified that we have about 5,000 child care workers across the state of Rhode Island. Um, more than 4,000 completed the professional development that was required of them upon reopening. So we feel pretty confident that our webinars and our technical assistance huddles were highly utilized by child care staff prior to reopening, which probably resulted um, in the high compliance with the regulations. If we move to the next slide, I think you will see that sort of the most common corrective action find findings pre-COVID are consistent with what other states have seen. Um, our providers typically struggle with maintaining child files, um, staff files, um, you'll see that a lot of times, um, particularly for center-based um, child care, it's really the administrative component of maintaining files, particularly health records. Um, if you move to the next slide, what is interesting is that the corrective action trends upon reopening are, have really shifted. Um, so you'll note one of the top findings that we see is that the cleaning materials are now within a child's reach and are not locked in a cabinet. Um, so that just speaks to the level of cleaning that our providers are doing and really adhering to the CDC guidelines. Um, child files continue to be an issue, but as you'll note, the most um, common corrective action findings are really not related to our COVID regulations. They're related to the regulatory framework that we had set forth even prior that reflect the federal kind of 11 health, required health and safety topics. As we move to the next slide, um, as I said, I felt like enforcement and unannounced monitoring was really critical to ensuring the success of our, uh, of our mitigation efforts for COVID. And so we actually took our QRIS framework and have merged that with our child care licensing unit. It's really exciting. And so we are keeping our QRIS warm by piloting a hybrid approach. They are going out and doing COVID reviews, our QRIS staff. So navigators and assessors who typically would have done ECHRs or on-site quality assessments um, or who would have maintained the quality rating improvement system for our programs are now blending that technical assistance approach for delivering quality improvement tips with COVID reviews. And so they are going out every day monitoring our child care facilities, sometimes in tandem with child care licensors to ensure that programs are adhering to COVID regulations and providing on-site technical assistance around how they can do things differently to prevent spread and um, exposure of COVID-19. And so just since starting these COVID reviews, um, I think I had shared that my team at the licensing unit has done 362 unannounced monitoring visits. Our QRIS system since September 1 has done an additional 223 COVID reviews. Um, and so these teams are really working in tandem to provide technical assistance, but also respond um, pretty, pretty, you know, regularly to programs. Um, if we move to the next slide, um, I want to introduce Amanda. I think the, the, the two things I wanted to leave the group with as I kick it off to my colleagues is, one, I wanted to say that, you know, 
a data gap for the state of Rhode Island was that we knew the license capacity of our child care programs as they reopened. We were struggling to gather enrollment data or attendance data because of our commitment to paying subsidies based on enrollment and not attendance. And also, we never collected private pay data from families, or you know, even pre-pandemic. So we have contracted with a vendor, um, public consulting group, who are assisting us with doing some statistically valid surveying efforts to really get a handle on how programs are utilizing the enhanced costs, um, the enhanced um, rates that we are executing, and also how many children they are actually serving on a day-to-day -day basis, and on average, how many they're excluding due to having one or more symptoms. Um, identified upon screening. And so previously we shared with you kind of what the license capacity was, but I'm excited to share with you that our utilization, um, which is the enrollment uh, on those on that license capacity, is showing that we had 74.9% of our licensed slots enrolled and available to families during the pandemic. So I think the narrative and the concern has always been, yes, programs are open, but are families actually attending? And I'm really, really excited to say that, yes, 75% of our slots are being utilized. And we estimate about 17,269 children actively enrolled in child care. Um, in terms of the costs associated, our programs have reported that I would say about 25% of our providers report using those enhanced rates to increase staff wages. Um, and about 76, or I'm sorry, all of our providers report about a, an increase of 76% in costs associated with cleaning due to adhering to the CDC guidelines. Um, so I just want to share that, you know, PCG has been a particularly strong partner in us understanding the overall health and utilization of our childcare system. I think it is short-sighted to just say, these are the number of programs that have opened. Um, it's really important to me to also say that those programs are being highly utilized by families. And it's just, I'm really proud of the work that our providers have done to support families. Um, and it's my privilege and honor to introduce Amanda from the Rhode Island Department of Health, um, who I speak to more than my own family, who has been really supportive and, on and honest and hardworking in making sure that childcare not only is successfully reopened, but that they remain open and safe. Caitlin, this is Sue, and we do have a couple of questions that have popped up in the chat before um, we pass it along to Amanda, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. I can't okay. see them, so if you wouldn't mind reading them. Sure, to me. absolutely. Um, Cheryl had asked if the numbers in Rhode Island, the COVID numbers, are they low? steady or rising right now? I don't know if you can answer They are that. rising. They yep, are rising. they are absolutely okay. rising. So community transmission has increased significantly. Okay, and thank you for that. And I think Ellen um, just wanted to confirm the date that all, she says all the agencies were required to close, but it was childcare, right? Yes, so we advised but not required closure beginning on March 6th. Okay. But then very quickly by March 13th, um, we signed, my, our governor signed an executive order requiring that all programs close. Okay, thank you. And Vanessa was wondering if the licensors are indeed conducting those visits in person. Oh yes, every visit is in person. Um, they're equipped with PPE, but um, these are all, so the 362 unannounced monitoring from the child care licensors, all done in person. And then RIAC, our QRAS um, colleagues, the 223 that they've done are all in person as well. Well, that's great. And one more question, and then we'll um, move on. But Bridget was wondering, did she understand correctly that you did cite violation related to COVID guidelines? So we have seen violations to COVID regulations. I would say between 90 to 95% of those are able to be rectified on site with technical assistance. So typically the COVID regulations that programs are struggling with the most is around, I think there, there's a couple of variations. For our family child care providers, because they are delivering care in a household setting, oftentimes we struggle, they will answer the door without a, without a mask on. So that is one 
frequent um, COVID regulations specific to family child care that we have been able to rectify on site with the provider with just some coaching and technical assistance. Um, for centers, I will say we don't observe non-compliance with stable groups, but they certainly report to us that this is their largest challenge. Um, the non-compliances related to COVID, um, and they're not really non-compliances. I think it's a variation on best practice. Um, we've learned a lot about screening protocols, and so um, programs, they vary in how they screen employees and, and families before entering the building. And so I would not necessarily that say that they're COVID non-compliant, but there are certainly room for improvement on how they're screening and excluding children and staff from entering the building if they disclose one or more symptoms. And that's really great that you approached it from the perspective of providing that technical assistance and really helping to address it on the spot. So, so that's really great news. Again, um, fantastic information. More questions are popping right up. So uh, we will either address those at the end in our Q&A or we'll do some follow-up. But there's some great questions. And I don't know, Caitlin, if you'll be able to see them in the chat later. Um, but I think this is wonderful information. I also wanted to thank Ruth for her great information. And I think now we are really, really pleased and excited to pass this on to Amanda, the epidemiologist at the Rhode Island Department of Health, who's going to share some more excellent information. All right, thank you. Um, so again, really glad to be here today um, with everyone. Thank you to Caitlin and Ruth for getting us started um, and for working so closely with me over these past couple of months. Um, although I'm not a mother myself, um, I definitely find, um, you know, providing quality um, child care and education um, near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's really, I would say, um, been a big part of how I've found my way into the public health field. Um, so with that, I'll talk more about um, our public health response from the Department of Health, um, starting off with some of the regulations and protocols that we implemented um, as we reopened centers. Um, so again, on June 1st, um, we enabled child care programs to reopen with some key guidelines to deliver safe care and early education um, to children across the state of Rhode Island. Really, the very key guidelines that we um, implemented were, first and foremost, stable group structure, which, um, as Caitlin had alluded to, um, we've uh, made sure that child care programs are maintaining consistent groups of 20, including children and staff, and that those children and staff are not mixing with other groups of children. And this is to mitigate the, the risk of transmission and to minimize the number of social contacts that any child or staff would have should they, you know, care. Uh, carry the virus or test positive in the center. And um, going off of that, physical distancing is again another key guideline in making sure that um, children and staff are maintaining their stable grouping, not mixing and mingling with other stable groups just to be sure um, that transmission is mitigated. Um, I will say that within a stable group, within that group of 20, um, physical distancing is not required given the low number of social contacts um, and the need to, um, you know, support children's social development. Another key guideline has been adherence to CDC disinfection guidelines, including frequent hand washing and disinfection of high touch services um, when there are, for example, um, shared play areas or playgrounds or bathrooms, um, those areas should be disinfected in between stable group use and um, after each use for each individual person to really, um, you know, increase disinfection practices there. Um, another key guideline has been enhanced pickup and drop-off processes, um, and these are put in place to prevent crowding and commingling, especially as parents are and guardians are trying to pick up and drop off their child. During this process, um, six-foot distancing is always maintained from a lot of our child care providers. They're reporting that this process has taken you know, anywhere from three to five minutes, if that, to really minimize the risk of transmission um, during that process. Um, some providers have even reported to us, and I hear this more and more frequently, is the use of mobile apps to check in their child, to screen their child on the app and it's really minimized the um, need to exchange paperwork or even time spent between parent and staff member um, to, um, you know, move a child into the program as they leave the program. 
And then um, there's a very robust daily symptom screening and monitoring process to check everyone at the door to make sure that they have no symptoms, that they have not been in contact with anyone. Um, the parent is responsible for signing off and attesting um, that their child is healthy and well and, and safe to enter the program. Um, and of course, all adults are masked in the child care programs, which is another key um, guideline to help ensure um, a safe reopening. So moving on to the next slide, oh, if we can go back. There we go. So child care response playbook. Um, I think Ruth had alluded to this as well. Um, this playbook has been really critical um, for child care providers. Um, this was developed um, in collaboration with the Department of Health, Department of Human Services, and our medical directors um, here at the department um, to just give a, um, a thorough, robust um, document to give guidance on how to respond to various child care scenarios that are related to COVID-19. And it's also meant to provide some visibility to those providers um, and what they would expect in the process when the Department of Health would, um, you know, intervene. So part of this playbook contains some quick tips and FAQs. It also includes a glossary of common terms, for example, what a close contact is defined as. Um, it also talks about the difference between quarantine and isolation, along with several other terms that we've used in this pandemic. And then really the bulk of the playbook is um, a list of the protocols for when a child or staff were to have positive, to have symptoms of COVID-19, or to be deemed as a close contact of a positive COVID-19 case outside of the child care program. And so from a Department of Health perspective, um, we've done a lot of work to respond to COVID-19 cases within child care programs. In addition to laboratory confirmed positive cases, we have um, investigated and responded to probable cases of COVID-19, which the CDC defines as any individual who meets one of the following criteria. Um, so any one of the symptoms um, in the left-hand box or any two of the symptoms on the right-hand box. And so part of our process of responding to lab-confirmed um, and probable cases of COVID-19, we get a lot of reports to our Department of Health, um, and they get triaged to the child care team in a couple of different ways. So first, um, a case could be reported to the Department of Health by a child care provider who called into our COVID info line. Um, and another example of how um, our team identifies child care cases is through our community case investigation work stream, where a case investigator interviewing a positive um, Rhode Island resident, and that resident identifies themselves as a child who attends a child care program or a staff member um, as an employee of a child care program. Um, in either situation, those cases are triaged to a specialized team at the Department of Health who is trained to respond to um, COVID-19 cases that appear in the child care setting. When our team intervenes, we do isolate those, those cases, um, either probable or confirmed. We then conduct structured interviews to identify infectious period places and common exposures both within the program and outside the program. We then conduct an investigation of the child care facility to identify close contact, to advise the program on disinfection, and um, give other um, public health advice as needed based on the child care scenario. From that point, we work with the child care program to collect the names and contact information of any close contacts of that child care case, um, and then we conduct our um, you know, contact tracing and providing guidance for quarantining of those contacts. And during that time that um, these contacts are placed on quarantine, we do um, monitor them for symptoms, both um, are one of two formats, either through a daily text message or through a weekly phone call from the department. I will say as far as quarantining close contacts and closures of classrooms due to a case of COVID-19, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, when we were um, less sure of um, symptomatic individuals and whether they were carriers of the virus, um, we have been closing classrooms and quarantining contacts of probable cases who met that probable case definition. 
Um, and that was just due to, um, you know, a need to be more conservative to understand, um, you know, those individuals that uh, present with the symptoms and how many of those that test positive. So we were um, quarantining classrooms and contacts in a child care center due to a probable case. But until August 7th, um, when we made a policy decision, again, this was in collaboration with the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health, where we looked at the data, looked to see how many of our cases are probable, and out of those probable cases, how many actually test and convert to positive. Um, and we found that very few had tested positive. And so given that, we made the policy decision on August 7th that we would not quarantine contacts of probable cases unless they were to convert to positive. And this has enabled more and more classrooms to remain open while a child or a staff member is isolating at home waiting for a positive test, or excuse me, waiting for a test. And so to talk about a couple of the findings from um, the first two months of reopening, and this, again, are the results presented in uh, the CDC paper that we published. Um, so between June 1st and July 31st of this year, the Department of Health investigated 101 possible child care associated cases. And of those cases, one third were confirmed positive, and the remaining two thirds had symptoms of COVID-19, which would fit the um, CDC case definition for a probable case. Um, so out of those individuals, um, about 50% of those symptomatic persons were excluded because they had tested and received a negative result. Um, so um, just focusing on the cases that um, were investigated, we um, saw around 89 classroom closures 687 children quarantined, and 166 staff quarantined due to cases of COVID-19 in child care settings. Just looking at a few more of the findings, children accounted for nearly 60% of the child care investigations and subsequent classroom closures and quarantines that we had looked at in those first two months. Um, so of those children, about 57% were confirmed, 43% were probable, and the mean age of these cases were around five, a range of five to 12 years old. And then um, we saw about 22 cases among adults, 73% were confirmed, 27% were probable, with a median age of 20, um, and a quite a bit wider range from 20 to 60 years of age. Of those cases that we investigated, they occurred in about 29 different child care programs, but of those programs, only four had two or more cases of COVID-19 where secondary transmission could not be ruled out. Um, and this table here is just showing um, a summary of those programs where we saw two or more cases and some of the epi linkages and lessons learned that we found from those programs. So um, the first program um, that we identified, a cluster, actually ended up having a total of 10 positive cases in their center. Um, and one of the things we found from this program was um, not adherence to the stable group methodology and ensuring that um, the same 20 group, uh, or the, the same group of 20 children and staff were maintained. Um, so we saw some floating, and we saw um, that some of those stable groups were mixing together, which put the results of the high number of cases reported from that program. As for the other programs, they saw uh, much fewer cases, um, usually two or three. Um, for example, the, some of the linkages and lessons learned that we found from these programs um, was, um, I'm just looking here, actually from the second program, all of the cases were reported from the same stable group, which is actually not too uncommon given the fact that with any stable group, it's the same group of children, they are not required to physically distance from each other, and they're also not required to mask. So um, not uncommon to see transmission within a stable group, but it is less common to see it, um, see transmission between stable groups. For program three, the epi language is actually a bit unclear. Each case was reported from a different stable group, but um, those two cases did not identify themselves 
as close contacts of each other. So they had denied being um, interacting with each other at any time. But the other piece that we learned from that um, cluster is that those two cases that were reported, they also had identified other community sources of exposure. So it is likely that they could have been exposed outside of the program, and the fact that they had both tested positive around the same time could have been isolated events. But again, we couldn't really rule um, secondary transmission out. And then for program four, again, we saw um, some breaches in stable group methodology, um, and there could have been um, a way to mitigate the transmission in that program um, if they had maintained that stable group structure. So as um, a couple of, of presenters have already mentioned, the collaboration and interagency between the Department of Health and Department of Human Services has been really critical during this time. Um, again, we huddle every day at 3 o'clock to conduct our case reviews and to walk through um, any challenges that have occurred throughout the day to really think about um, how we can be supporting each other and making the right public health decision and the best um, you know, economic decision for these programs. And then, um, so that's on a daily basis. On a biweekly basis, our um, colleagues meet together to do um, a policy review where we look at the data um, over the last two weeks and try to make the most informed policy decisions to, again, support safe reopening of child care programs and to um, make sure that we are supporting them in this reopening process. So a couple of things that we have, um, we have done in these policy reviews is, again, as I have mentioned, in looking at the data for probable cases, we decided on August 7th that we would not quarantine close contacts of probable cases unless a person receives a positive test result. So again, this has enabled more child care classrooms to stay open while a probable case is isolating at home, waiting for a test result. And if that test result comes back negative, that person can return as long as they meet other, um, other criteria that we have for them. But if the person tests positive, at that point, we would then quarantine um, that child or that staff member's contact in the child care setting. Another example of some policy changes is that on September 14th, which was actually when our schools reopened in the state of Rhode Island, the Department of Human Services at that point required face coverings for all school-aged children. And um, we defined school-aged children in the state as any child who is at least five years of age and in kindergarten. And the reason for requiring masking for this age group and older is given that they are, during the day, going to school, and they have, um, you know, higher um, social contact, school contact. And so um, given their higher risk of catching COVID-19, um, we have um, required face coverings for that age group. Um, but anyone younger than that age group um, at this time are not required to mask in their child care program. So um, the data from the CDC paper presents what we found between the first two months. Um, but just to give an update on where our case count is currently, as of October 30th, we've seen 144 confirmed child care cases in the state of Rhode Island. 69 have been among children, and 75 have been among staff. So we've seen about a 50-50 split between children and staff testing positive in a child care setting. These cases have accounted for about 114 classroom closures, over 1,000 children quarantined, and 265 staff quarantined to date. This figure just shows um, our breakdown of case counts in child care settings by a weekly basis reported um, through an MMWR week. So that's from Saturday to, or it's from Sunday to Saturday. So the, the red bar, they're just showing our case counts per week. And the blue line is actually showing our incidence rate um, in the state of Rhode Island over time. So it's just to show you the comparison of our community case rate versus our child care case count. And you can see that um, in the last couple of weeks, starting at around um, MMWR week 39, we started to see um, a pivot point in our community cases where we saw um, higher incidence rates 
of COVID-19 cases overall in the state. Um, and at that point, we also saw um, a slightly higher increase in child care cases over the last couple of weeks. And so um, looking at uh, additional trends in secondary transmission to date, we have seen around 16 clusters of cases in child care settings. And a cluster we define as a setting with two or more cases within a 14-day period. Um, and this table just summarizes some of the common reasons or possible sources of transmission that led to two or more cases in a child care program. As you can see, um, the most common source of transmission has been because those cases occurred within the same stable group, which again is not uncommon given um, that those within a stable group, physical distancing is not required. Um, other common sources of transmission have been when stable groups have not been consistently maintained, as well as um, non-adherence to physical distancing. And, um, and we've also seen because Rhode Island is a small state, um, many of our cases that we actually see popping up within a child care program might be actually related outside of the program. And so what I mean by that is that um, we might see two cases in a child care setting, but those cases happen to be best friends or they happen to be siblings that live in the same house. And transmission could have happened or occurred within the household or within another social setting. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. And so with that, um, I'll just kick it off to um, the next in the group and maybe address a couple of questions um, either related to um, our data or any other um, questions about our regulations and collaboration. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, that was really comprehensive information. And um, I think people were really fascinated. We did have a couple of questions, if you can hear me all right. Um, and this one may sure. have been answered. Um, Miriam had posed a question about those daily huddles. And I'm not sure, sure. if you answered them. Um, but is there anything else that you can expand upon about those daily huddles? She had asked if it's done with local public health departments. Sure. Um, and Kaylin, um, feel free to um, jump in as well. So our daily huddles we do at 3 o'clock every day, um, and that's just based on when our staff, um, our AM staff and PM staff um, shift over. Um, we meet, it is the Department of Health, Department of Human Services. Um, within the Department of Health, it's our nursing staff, epidemiological staff, and our case investigators who are specialized in child care and they're there to report on whatever investigations were conducted. Um, because we are a small state, we only have one Department of Health overseeing the entire state of Rhode Island. Um, so we are, um, you know, one specialized unit. And I think the benefit of that is we can work together within a common setting um, to be able to um, make the most informed public health decisions when we are trying to investigate um, a child care um, situation. Thank you, Amanda. And Miriam, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we did have one other question about whether there had, you know, I don't know if you can answer this or Caitlin, but if there's been any incidents of, of spread of COVID um, amongst licensors who are going into these programs to do visits. This is Caitlin. Um, no, we've not had any instances of a licensor contracting COVID during a monitoring visit, nor have we had any instances of a licensor spreading COVID okay. during a monitoring Great. visit. Thank you so much. Um, so Miriam says thank you very much. And Amanda, great information again. Thanks so much. I know people are asking about the PowerPoint. I think we're going to answer that in the chat. Um, so. Really, we've heard some wonderful information, some data, the really great work that you've done on the partnerships and in the efforts to keep the spread of COVID down. And I think now, you know, the exciting part of wrapping this together is that we're going to hear from Amanda Eagle, a child care director at the Pawtucket YMCA, and she's going to talk about how this looks in practice in, in programs. So really excited to turn it over to you.
Andrea. And you may be muted. You can star six to unmute, Andrea. So I think Andrea is having um, maybe some technical issues with getting off mute. Carrie? It looks like your line, Andrea, is open through Adobe, so you do not need to press star six. But if you have your mute button on your phone on, that might also need to be taken off. How about now? Can you hear me now? Excellent. Are you able to yes. hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so we don't want again. to miss what you have to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about that. Thanks again for um, for uh, attending this webinar, and thank you for um, to Caitlin for asking for my input on how um, our child care programs have been able to help families get back to work and keep our kiddos um, safe while they're here in our care. Um, so I'm the executive director of a child care program in Pawtucket. Um, I, we have three early learning centers for children, um, infants through pre-K, and then we also have 16 school age children, um, school age sites. Um, so pre-COVID, we were serving about a little over 1,900 children, and today um, we're serving a little over 600. And um, so a lot of that has to, a lot, most of that is our school age children due to sites not being able to open in school. Um, but I just want to go over some of the achievements that we've kind of had um, since you know June 1st when we opened. Um, our biggest achievement is we're allowing um, allowing us to serve our, serve our families again. We missed our kids, we missed our families, um, the, the, and it was great to be able to welcome them back into our centers um, in June. Um, in September, when schools decided to go virtual, uh, child care centers stepped up and said, don't worry, we've got this, we're here to help our families, um, we'll do whatever is possible, we'll do whatever is needed in order to have um, our families go back to work and help the economy of Rhode Island um, and support our kids while they were in our care. Um, we've become very creative in how to engage our families. Um, we've done uh, Facebook groups. We've done daily take-home sheets. So because families are not allowed into our building, uh, we didn't want to miss that connection that we have with the teachers and the staff and, and just basically everybody. So we've created Facebook program, uh, Facebook accounts um, for all of the sites. We've done daily take-home sheets so a child um, leaves the classroom with a sheet every day just to say how their day was and what fun things they did in the classroom. Um, we've uh, subscribed to a free app called Class Tag, and um, we've been able to have conversations with parents via text. We can send pictures to the parents. Um, so that's been you know, a great thing, and the parents really love it. Um, this picture that you're seeing here is we did a Facebook bingo game. So one night we did bingo, and we were um, normally we do a family engagement activity once a month. And we were kind of knowing that we can't come into uh, families can't come into the building. We created a Facebook um, program, and um, it was well received. The children had a blast. Um, it was 30 minutes. It was not a long time. We played two games of bingo. Um, and the families had a great time, and they're already asking for what we're going to do next. So we've already started working on plans for teachers reading stories through Facebook, um, a Facebook Live event. Um, I'm sorry, a Zoom, not Facebook. Zoom Live event, a Zoom uh, bingo, so different Zoom events that we can do with families. Um, so that's been kind of a, a nice thing, and it really, um, we've seen more staff get involved because they can do it at home. Um, they don't have to leave their house. Um, you know, they can do it while their kids are at home and they're, you know, they're, they're still with their family. So that, um, that's been very helpful. Um, and then I know a lot of, we've talked a lot about the response playbook. Um, I use that on a daily basis, um, sometimes four, five, six, seven times. It's an awesome tool. It really walks me through 
Um, it's a great like flowcharty type thing. It walks me through if a child has a symptom, if a staff has a symptom, what to do when, how to do it. Um, so that has been all an awesome um, resource for me. And all the staff, um, all of our sites are required to have that there. So all of our directors have it. Um, it is updated often, so we just, you know, there's been a new one for October, so it's really great. It keeps everybody up to um, up to date on what to do, and it kind of takes some of the guesswork out. Um, another great thing that's happened is we have a direct email and phone line to the Department of Health, and it's dedicated to child care. So if I have a question about um, a child or a family or a staff member, I can call this head hotline, and it really, um, you know, they've been very quick to read on the phone call within the day to let me know whether or not I need to quarantine or um, stop a child from coming in or allowing the child to come in. So that's been, you know, that's been kind of, um, that's been a plus and it has been an, actual, an, ex an excellent resource. Um, our child care assistance program, the temporary rate enhancement has been huge for us. Um, one of my centers is predominantly state assistance and um, so being able to get the extra money through um, DHS to allow us to purchase and stay afloat um, and purchase the PPE and the cleaning supplies um, and help with the fact that our enrollment is a little bit lower um, has been a very, it has allowed us to open. Because um, to be honest, without that, um, some of our centers would not have been able to um, open at all due to just a huge loss of revenue um, um, without that. And then um, the, the providers paying us on attendance and not enrollment. So that is also huge. Um, you know, we're, we're requiring families to stay home when their child has the sniffles or isn't healing well or if they have to quarantine. So not knowing if we weren't going to get paid for that um, is very hard, knowing that we still have to pay staff, we still have to pay rent, we still have to pay all of those other um, Expenses and knowing that we don't have to worry about that fluctuation in attendance um, for our kids um, has been helpful for programs to stay open. Um, we've been given the free and rapid testing for all of our teachers and students. So we have a, a list of um, places where our families, I mean our staff and our children can go if they feel they need a test. Um, and usually it's between, you know, we're getting results sometimes before they even leave the place. Um, or within 24 to 48 hours. So that has been very helpful, um, especially with staff who may have symptoms um, or probable symptoms, and we're telling them they can't come back until um, they have a negative test. So this is able, this has allowed us to be able to get um, staff back to work, um, you know, as long as it's ne negative, um, and that's been great. And one of the biggest things that has come out of this is our buildings are super clean. Um, it smells clean, it's, um, it looks clean, and it's, you know, it's been um, one of those best practices that we all uh, want to uh, strive for through Eckers and Itters, that everything is clean and sparkly and smells great and, and you know, is disinfected, and it, that really is happening um, in, in, on a daily basis. Our teachers have cleaning checklists that they have to sign off on. Um, we allow our staff to come in um, 15 minutes prior to the children coming in, and, and they stay 15 minutes after the children are coming in just to make sure that everything is um, clean and ready so when the children do arrive, um, all the toys that have been cleaned the night before and are left out to dry have been put away. Um, so that has really been um, what, it's one of the positives, I should say, um, of, of what's been going on. And then we've had some challenges. Um, one of the big challenges is, um, as you can see from the prior slide, some of our enrollment is down. Um, our, I think uh, across the state we're finding that um, infants um, are, are, are struggling to return to our programs, um, which you can under, completely understand. Families are, are nervous about sending their babies to us or, or to child care. Um, so that's been a low enrollment. And then also our school age staff, um, I'm sorry, our school age program. Um, schools are using a lot of the spaces that we were currently using or previously using. 
Um, so they're using those spaces now to store a lot of the extra furniture and supplies that they need. So typically our school age programs are in cafeterias or gyms, um, and now those spaces are being used to, to um, store desks or to store equipment that is, doesn't fit in the classroom. So we're not able to um, have programs in the building, and um, so that has caused a big um, a big problem with our enrollment. Um, and then also the fact that the social the distance learning. So most of our schools are in some sort of a hybrid method or model where they're in school a few days and they're doing distance learning. So families have, um, you know, some families have figured it out or are working from home um, or just want to make sure that they're there for their child for a uh, one-on-one -on -one for distance learning. So we're finding that our school age enrollment is really is really low and causing you know some financial burden on some of our programs um, and then staffing so there's a lot of factors in staffing um, we've had staff that are afraid were afraid to come back uh, we've had staff that um, have kids at home that need they want to do the distance learning with at home um, we've had staff with high-risk health conditions so they are you know really unable to come back some of our older staff so that has caused some um, stress in our program, and then you know just the the distant, just the probable cases of quarantine. So as you saw, our numbers in Rhode Island are you know just like across the country are increasing, and what that means is we're getting more staff and more children in the community that need to quarantine with for um, reasons of they came in contact with somebody or they have a probable case. So what happens is they need to be out for 10 days or 14 days or some, some 24 days. Um, so what we're finding that during that time, um, you know, my, my, my joke that I say all the time to staff is I can't close a register down because you can't come to work. Um, I'm, I'm not a grocery store and I can't just do that. So we can't tell families that they can't come in because we don't have staff. So we have to figure out how we can maintain ratios and high quality um, while these staff members are doing their quarantine or dealing with um, an illness or a family member. Um, and then we have to pay those staff based on the, you know, the law of the FFCRA. So we're paying those staff to stay home to care for an illness or during that quarantine, but then we also have to pay staff to actually cover those classrooms. So financially, you're paying two people for one position. Um, so that, that again, is, is, has been a, a challenge, um, especially when, you know, most of our programs are, 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 just, make, are just making ends meet or just trying to um, at least not lose, as, you know, a lot of money so we can keep going. And then the stable pods. So um, like most of you, I'm assuming that <clears throat> you, know, you open at 6.30 in the morning, and you may open one infant room, one toddler room, a preschool room, and then as kids go, you open more rooms as you get more kids and more staffing. Well, with stable pods, every room has to open at, the, at, um, at, at open, and every room has to close. So where you might have only had um, you know, four staff come in at 6.30, now we need to have one staff per classroom. So that may end up being nine staff, or in, in one of my buildings, that's 20 staff. So I have to have 20 openers and 20 closers. So you may have a staff member that's in a classroom, and a, a child doesn't even enter that classroom for the first hour, um, or, or you may have a classroom that, you know, the children are there right at opening. So we've had to reduce our hours of care since we can't combine those groups. So typically we are a 12 hour or 6, 6.30 to 6 or so 11 and a half hour day. Um, we've reduced that to 7.45 to 5.15. And basically that gives us the opener comes in at 7.30 and then the closer uh, comes in at 8.30 and works until 5.30. So, um, we're able to maintain ratio, we're able to maintain every classroom is open and closed, so we never have to combine pods um, at any time. 
so that, um, you know, so that has reduced our hours of care, which is a challenge to some of our families. Some of our families, you know, the reason we're all open at 6.30 is because we have families that need us at 6.30 because they work at 7 or they have to take the train or so that has um, caused some of our enrollment, um, some people not to come back because of that. And then um, since we're not allowing families in the building, it's the cost of extra staff to just run kids back and forth. So we've really used the all, all hands on deck approach. Um, myself included, you know, we've had the CEO come out, we've had anybody that um, is in the building um, from until 9.30, there is no one in offices. Everyone is helping run children to their classroom or taking temperatures um, or working the front desk to greet families. Um, and then that all starts up again at 3 o'clock. So, you know, from 7.45 to about 9.30, everybody's kind of doing that. And then again, from 3 to 5.15, um, we have staff doing that. So uh, we do the best we can with minimizing the cost there by using um, directors and as many people as we can, um, but there is some extra staff that, you know, that is, there is some cost to that. Um, and some, another challenge is um, our playground times are reduced. So um, one of the requirements is you clean your playgrounds in between use and that no pods can be combined. So typically we would have two to three classrooms outside in a playground setting during a you know an allotted amount of time depending on the size of the playground um, and they would be outside for maybe a 45 minute block in the morning and then another 45 minute block in the afternoon uh, we all know that through bright um, through inners and eckers that is best practice um, but basically we have we are down to children only going outside once a day um, and pretty much for about a half an hour, 35 minutes, because we need to clean the playground in between, so that's usually a 10 to 15 minute buffer in between each group, and then um, because we can't combine pods, so that, that has been um, another challenge for us. Um, and then just the cost and time for cleaning. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have the, the teachers are doing a phenomenal job doing their own classroom. So they are required to clean their own toys. Um, again, like I told you, they come in early to clean all of the door handles and the soap dispensers and all of that stuff in the morning. And then we have a cleaning crew that comes in and, and does it again. Um, and then we have crews during the day just cleaning bathrooms in between every group that goes in there if we can't. So some of our centers, we can assign a bathroom to a classroom, but not all of them. So it really depends, so we make sure that those bathrooms are cleaned in between each group. Um, and that's, again, that's just, there's cost and there's, there's a big time, um, there's a cost to that and there's also some, um, a lot of time that needs to happen, that needs to happen. Um, and then we talked about the public schools not allowing us in their building, so that has been a struggle trying to figure out how we can get these families into some of our, um, our YMCA programs that may not be offering uh, classes to uh, fitness classes, so we're, we've changed some of those fitness classroom rooms to distance learning rooms. Uh, we've converted our gyms into distance learning rooms um, since the, we're not, you know, they're not open to the public at this time. So, um, we're, you know, we're doing the best that we can. And then for those programs, we, now we have to pick the children up from school instead of being at the school. So those classes are higher because we can only limit the number of kids on a bus. So, um, which we completely understand and it's one to a seat and it's every other seat. So, um, but again, so what might have been one bus run tends to be two bus runs for every, um, for every school. So that's been a cost. And then just the virtual learning. Um, you know, we have some children that are really, really struggling with virtual learning. Um, I have in the current building I'm in right now, um, I have about 25 K-1-2, um, I'm sorry, first and second grade distance learning children. And it takes almost four to five staff on a daily basis just to help those kids navigate their laptops and Google Classroom and what assignment and 
keeping them on track and making sure everyone's schedule is followed and um, you know, not make, making sure children are not missing their, their, their Zoom meets or their assignments. Um, and you know, we take really, we take pride in the fact that we're able to do all that stuff so parents can go to work um, and that, um, but it is, it, it can be very challenging. It's, 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 this is being put on the shoulders of childcare staff that um, have not going to school for teaching and are doing the best that they can um, navigating the virtual learning for these kiddos. Um, we're making it work. It's very difficult, but we're making it work. And um, by Friday afternoon, we're all ready to go home. <laughs> Um, Andrea, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your perspective. It's so important to again have heard the ways in which you've been um, you've been working, the ways in which the collaboration and opportunities have happened, and the ways in which uh, children and families are served, and and the support. I think too. I've just put in the um, in the chat that Rhode Island outbreak response protocol. Um, they call it a playbook. It's down there in the link. And we do want folks to know that we're go going to um, go ahead and email to anyone that had to leave a bit early the, um, the links for sure, uh, especially to the playbook and to um, the paper that came out uh, in discussion. We so much appreciate your time this afternoon. It's been so wonderful to hear from the presenters. We appreciate your ongoing collaboration across departments and with providers, children, and families, and appreciate the support that, that you've given um, to one another um, and to moms and families everywhere. Um, at this time, we do have a couple of um, evaluation questions that we can put up. We also are going to keep the chat open and give you the opportunity to um, uh, to respond there with any uh, with any other questions. And once again, thank you so much for for your time, um, presenters, and so much for your time out there in um, in the in the in the nation and doing the work you do. So appreciated. Thank you.